Today I'm going to be sharing with you a very unique subject. I oftentimes try to stay away from what I refer to as dated topics because I like what we preach and what we teach to be timeless. And by that I mean that no matter when a person listens, that the truth that they're listening to is from the Bible and is not bound by an era, a culture, or news or dates. But I'm going to make an exception to that today because of the importance of the subject. Just recently we have seen a peace treaty brokered with Israel and with the United Arab Emirates. And so I want to answer your questions because I've had so many in social media that have been asking questions and it's worthy of an answer. So in today's broadcast we're going to focus upon President Trump's treaty with Israel and the UAE and how does that apply to Bible prophecy. Let's begin with a foundation in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, go down to verse 1. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful, and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and not to pour out His anger on us. Christ died for us, so that whether we are dead or alive, when He returns, we can live with Him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. With that laid down as a Bible foundation, we're going to begin to take you into a little bit of background because this is very important. But uh, if you have not been watching the news or if you uh, homestead or live off grid and, and uh, somehow you're coming across this and this is all brand new to you, President Donald J. Trump brokered an agreement to normalize relations between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel. This is the first such agreement between Israel and a major Arab country since 1994. The Israel-United Arab Emirates Peace Agreement, or as it's being called the Abraham Accord, was agreed to by Israel and the UAE on August 13th of this year, 2020. The countries have committed to the exchange of embassies and ambassadors and have begun a cooperation in a broad range of fields which would include education, health care, trade, security, and other details. This historic breakthrough is the most significant step towards peace in the Middle East in over 25 years. And this is why it has received so much international attention and people are paying attention. The United Arab Emirates is the first major Arab state to recognize Israel since the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty was signed in October of 1994. 
In light of the international news and global attention of President Trump's treaty between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, I have been literally deluged with comments on social media. Many people recognize our devotion to the subject of Bible prophecy over our ministry of 40 years. And I oftentimes, and will do so today, it is very important that you have a trusted voice in Bible prophecy in these last days. And I would like to humbly request that I would be allowed into your life and into your heart and into your Christian mentoring as a trusted voice to wade through all of the complexities of these last days. Because every time something like this happens, and I've seen it uh, repeatedly throughout my lifetime, and this current treaty between Israel and the United Arab Emirates has been no exception. It's amazing to me the amount of foolishness that is being attached to this current treaty. But the questions that I have received uh, have ranged from questions simply asking, is this peace treaty, the peace treaty found in Daniel chapter 9, all the way to questions like, doesn't this prove that Donald Trump is the Antichrist? And every amount of question in between uh, has come my way. But before we begin to discuss how this lady, uh, this latest peace treaty relates to Bible prophecy, uh, most of you are going to need a review in important history. Now, I don't want to turn this into a boring uh, professorial history class, but it is important. If you are a sincere Christian and if you are a sincere student of the Bible, you need to have a basic, fundamental understanding of the history of the Middle East and the conflict that is going on not only now, but throughout most of history between the Jewish people and the Arabs. And if the average Christian were to be asked to lay down some of the fundamentals as to why there has not been peace in the Middle East, most Christians, and when I say Christians, most people really would not be able to provide accurate details as to why there has been this ongoing conflict in the Middle East. And so this is not going to be an exhaustive history class on Middle East relations and conflicts and Israel and Arabs and so on, but it is important that if you're going to understand Bible prophecy in the last days, you really need to understand the major conflict and the disagreements and the abrasive political agenda that's gone on in this region of the world for a long, long time. So I'm going to ask you to pay very careful attention. As always, we encourage you when you listen to our broadcast to do so with the Bible and to also do so with the ability to take notes, whether you keep a literal a collegiate notebook and write things down with pen and paper or you do it digitally, doesn't matter to me, but you're not going to retain all of this just by listening to it one time. And so what I, I would like to encourage you to do is as you have time over the next month, I want you to listen to this broadcast uh, a few times. I know that uh, for some that's a, a big ask, but if you really are intent on becoming more up to date and more understanding in Bible prophecy and Israel and the Arab conflict and the Middle East problems, uh, you really need to have some of this as a working knowledge. It's a family conflict that's almost 4,000 years old and goes all the way back to Abraham. And though it is a political subject and an international subject in the news, uh, its roots are found in the Bible. And so if you have your Bible, go with me into the book of Genesis and the 16th chapter. Genesis chapter 16. 
And let's see where all of this started. Genesis chapter 16, go down to verse 7. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit. To her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, You are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours. Now, I want you to pay attention to this, because prior to Ishmael being born, and by the way, this is why Christians are so unbending on the subject of life begins in the womb, because there are countless stories in the Bible that show us that life begins not at the moment of birth, but life begins at conception in the womb of a mother. And so we find it here with Ishmael. While he is still a baby, still in his mother's womb, apparently from what we can uh, understand from original text, in the very beginning of his birth stage, Ishmael is being prophesied over by an angel of the Lord. <clears throat> Here's what the angel said. Let's go back. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, have I truly been the one who sees me? So that well was named Bir Laheroi, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Now here we come to one of the most important things that you're going to learn today. Be sure to make note of it. The Arabs are the descendants of Abraham's son, Ishmael. Now if you're a new student of the Bible, uh, Abram was his birth name. His name was later changed to Abraham, and most of you would know him by that latter name, Abraham, and also with Sarai. That was her birth name, and it was later changed to Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah have been promised a covenant child by God, but things don't seem to be working out. And so Sarah gets involved and suggests that Abraham have a son by her mistress by the name of Hagar. And this is how Ishmael is born. But Ishmael was not the promised son. But this is very important. Write it down. Ishmael is the father of the Arab people and the Arab nations. Now, go down in Genesis 17 to verse 17. Genesis 17 and verse 17. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, May Ishmael 
live under your special blessing. But God replied, no. Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac. And I want you to highlight that in your Bible. Uh, this is not only important to your understanding of the Jewish nation, this is of great understanding for you in Bible prophecy. Highlight that in your Bible. The scripture said, my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God had finished speaking, he left Abraham. And so here's the second thing that I want you to be sure to write down and understand. The Jewish people are the descendants of Abraham's son, Isaac. The Arab people and the Arab nations are the descendants of Ishmael. And the Jewish people are the descendants of Abraham's son, Isaac. Now, Jews believe that Isaac was the promised one who would inherit the blessings of Abraham. Now, stay with me. And again, I've asked you to really pay attention today because this is going to require uh, some intelligence and some focus. But I'm helping you to understand. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning, which we have done in the book of Genesis and we're going to show you where this Middle East conflict began. We're going to walk you from the days of Abraham until the signing of this peace treaty with President Trump just a few days ago and help you to understand exactly how all of this ties into Bible prophecy. But I feel it is of utmost importance that you understand this from a biblical perspective and not just from a political perspective. Because if you're listening to the news, you're only going to hear a political bent and bias on the subject. But those of us who are students of Bible prophecy know that all of this is a thread being woven from the time of Abraham right up into the rapture of the church leading in to the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign, and so on. The Bible has never been wrong in predictions and in prophetic content, and it will not start now. You can be assured of that. So the Jews believe that Isaac is the promised son and that the covenant of Abraham applies to Isaac and the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. But the Muslims do not accept that. Most of you are aware of the fact that their holy book is a book called the Quran. And the Quran teaches that Ishmael is the promised son and that all of the covenant of Abraham goes to Ishmael. The Quran teaches that on Mount Moriah it was not Isaac who was being offered as a sacrifice, but the Quran teaches it was Ishmael who had been bound and laid upon the altar. And Abraham was prepared to sacrifice that son Ishmael. And so again, I'm trying to help you to understand the points of historic conflict that tie, in, uh, tie into the Middle East scenario of today. It goes all the way back to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and the Arab nations and the Muslim people and the Jewish people, and the Jewish nation of Israel, all of this is tied together. The ancient debate over who was the son of promise is the root of Middle Eastern hostility today. 
And many of you perhaps did not know that, but now you do. This ancient debate over which son is the son of promise, was it Ishmael or was it Isaac, is the very root of the hostility that continues on in the Middle East today. Now, if you're not a Bible believer, you may have various debate upon which of those is accurate. But the Bible, don't miss this, the Bible leaves no wiggle room. For the scripture says in Genesis 17 that the promised covenant son is Isaac born from Abraham and Sarah. For thousands of years in Middle Eastern history, Jews and Arabs, and a lot of people are not aware of this, but for thousands of years they have lived in relative peace and indifference towards one another. The primary cause of the current hostility is more modern in its origins. And again, for many of you, you're going to be feeling like you're listening to the History Channel instead of a Bible study on Bible prophecy in this current treaty that's been signed by our president in Israel and the UAE. But again, hold with me because all of this is vitally important for you not only as a student of history, but more importantly, for you as a student of the Bible. Every student of the Bible and every student of Bible prophecy needs to have a working fundamental knowledge of what I'm going to be teaching today. Many of the current conflicts can be traced to decisions that were made after World War I. Uh, by the victorious allies, and that would be largely Britain and France, because they divided up the territory of what had been the Ottoman Empire. And Palestine was the name given to a land area in the Middle East, and uh, very important. It was the Arabs who named a landmass uh, in this conflict of agreements after World War I and even prior in the Middle East. Uh, Palestine was actually absorbed into the Ottoman Empire in 1517 and remained under the control of the Turks until World War I. Now towards the end of World War I, the Turks were defeated by the British forces and the British had made a number of conflicting commitments. Uh, I think that might be the most polite way to say it. Uh, and this is not going to be an exhaustive study of the entirety. But let me just say the British were guilty of making conflicting commitments after World War I. They had promised the Arabs independence in return for them taking up arms with them against the Turkish Ottoman rulers. And uh, that was the uh, McMahon-Hussein Agreement of 1915. But this is a very important agreement that uh, you should understand as a student of Bible prophecy, and that is referred to, if you're writing it down, it's called the Balfour Declaration that was made in November of 1917. And the Balfour Declaration, in most simple definition, was a peace treaty or an accord or an agreement where the British announced support for a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Very important, and I would encourage you uh, to do some homework and to learn the details of the Balfour Declaration of November 1917. The problem is this land had already been populated and promised to the Arab people. So after the war, the British decided that they wanted to maintain control of Palestine, and a lot of the reason for that was because they had made conflicting commitments. Let's move up a little bit in history and 
All of you who are historians, please pardon me for giving you the Cliff Notes version of this, but I want to move you through the origins of a lot of the modern conflict and take you into Bible prophecy. Because ultimately where I'm headed in the moments uh, before us is I want you to understand, has the United States brokered a treaty with Israel and the United Arab Emirates in a fashion that overlays with final Bible prophecy. That's where we're headed. After World War II, uh, the British again uh, did not learn from the lessons of World War I, and they were guilty again of making conflicting commitments to various ones. And it became uh, such a point of contention with those who had been promised that the British had to turn to the United Nations to act as a political referee to help in these matters. During World War II, as most of you know, and the numbers vary depending upon whose history you're reading, but somewhere between 6 and 11 million Jews were slaughtered by Adolf Hitler throughout the European nations. And of course, what a dark chapter in history. Adolf Hitler believed that they were nothing more than animals and that the Jews should be eliminated from the face of the earth. But he was unsuccessful in this attempt to, to rid the face of the earth from the Jewish people. But after World War II, uh, many nations, with the United States being one of the leading nations, uh, embraced the idea that there should be a Jewish state in British-ruled Palestine. But there was a slight problem because of their conflicting commitments. There were already about 1.4 million Arabs already living in that land. But in 1947, the United Nations voted to divide that area in Palestine and to make an Arab state, and to make a Jewish state. Now obviously the Jews were eager to accept this partition plan, but the Arabs who outnumbered the Jews and had been made certain promises by Britain uh, rejected it wholeheartedly and were beyond angered by the partition plan. When the British left and Israel declared independence in 19. 48, five Arab nations allied together to attack Israel with the plan of again eradicating them from the Palestinian state. Uh, those five nations were Egypt, uh, at that time it was called Transjordan, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. Now very important that you understand uh, those five nations because they are still major players in the conflict in current hour. Israel defeated the Arabs' forces, and not only did they defeat this five-nation coalition of Arab nations that had come against them, they defeated them and stripped from them all of the land that had been given to them by the United Nations. And as a result, approximately, again, numbers depending upon historians that you study, about 750,000 Arabs, just under a million, depending again upon the historians studied, fled this land and relocated in other Arab states in that region. Now let me jump from 1947 and 1948 all the way up to 1967. And again, those of you that are true historians, pardon me for the Cliff Notes approach to this, but I'm trying to hurry along to give you what I believe every Christian should know as a fundamental working history of Middle Eastern conflict and an understanding of the conflict that began all the way back in Genesis and moves its way as a prophetic thread all the way up into the end times. But in 1967 was the infamous Six-Day War. 
And in that war, Israel preemptively uh, strikes Egypt after Egypt and Syria and Jordan had planned another attack upon Israel. After the Six-Day War of 1967, Israel now had full control of what we now call the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which was later returned to Egypt, but it included the West Bank, it included the Gaza Strip, it included the Golan Heights, and all of Jerusalem. And so now the Arabs have thought they were going to completely remove the Israeli state, and they were going to eliminate the Jewish people from this region of the land. But when the dust settles after the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel has literally redrawn the map of the Middle East. Fascinating study. Don't have time to get into all of the details of it, but this obviously added to the anger against the Jews and against Israel in this region of the world, especially in them taking over in totality the city of Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem not only contained sacred sites that were of great value to the Jewish people, but it also contained sacred sites to the Muslims as well as Christians. Between 1948 and 1967, the Jews had redrawn the map of the Middle East and had demonstrated clearly superior military power. So if you've been paying attention, we've walked you from Genesis with God's covenant promise to Abram, who later had a name changed to Abraham, his wife Sarai, originally birth named Sarai, later became Sarah. Abraham and Sarah had been promised a covenant son of supernatural blessing. And the Bible said the covenant son was Isaac. Ishmael, because of Sarah's mistaken interference, in trying to help the covenant of God along, a son by the name of Ishmael was born, and the conflict dates all the way back. And we read it there in Genesis 16, 17, and it continues. Now, again, Isaac is the father of the Jewish nation. Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations. After 1967, in response, the Palestinians began to call for a homeland of their own, which the United Nations had already given them in the partition plan, but they wanted all of it and their attack against Israel, uh, which was very small. I mean, it's an amazing, miraculous uh, study of history and war history to see how Israel was supernaturally protected by God. And uh, wish I had time to get in that. A later date we will. But in 1967, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, you may recognize it as the PLO, was formed. And the PLO had basic principles and goals, which included a right to an independent state and the destruction of the state of Israel. And that, in a nutshell, was the stance of this organization called the PLO. Hundreds of people were killed in years of attack upon Israel. Yasser Arafat, a name that most of you will recognize, was the original leader of the PLO. He was branded as a terrorist by Israel and by the United States as well. But most of the world, and almost all of the Arab world, did not consider him as a terrorist. They called him a freedom fighter. And their allies around the world supported him financially, militarily, and in many other ways. Now, Yasser Arafat died, I believe it was in uh, 2004, and was succeeded by Rahi Fatou. And he is the current leader of the PLO. Now, this is just a brief 
overview. And if you have paid attention and have been diligent to listen up until this point, uh, I commend you. Because now we're going to begin to take this a little closer to the Bible and a little closer to Bible prophecy. But I really felt that most of you perhaps have not had from a biblical perspective a historic lesson on the Middle Eastern conflict. And so I wanted to take the time, and again, uh, all of the true historians that may eventually listen to this teaching and to this broadcast, please pardon me for running through just the tips along the pathway through history. But we have taken you from Abraham, the birth of Ishmael, the birth of Isaac, all the way up until modern times. Now there's just a few more things that I want you to understand before we take this into the final end time scenario of Bible prophecy and how this peace treaty brokered by President Trump uh, to Israel and to the UAE, how does that apply to final Bible prophecy just before we arrive there? I want you to understand that there are four main unresolved conflicts that exist today. And again, I want you, if you're taking notes, and I trust that you are, I want you to write these four conflicts down because everything that's happening now revolves around these four unresolved problems in the Middle East. Number one is the unresolved problem of the settlements. The Palestinians want the Israelis to withdraw to the pre-1967 borders and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. And if you're paying attention, you'll remember that the United Nations, uh, trying to be a moderator with the conflicting promises of Britain, establishes a partition plan and a certain part of this land is divided and given to the Palestinians as, as state and given to the Israelis as a state through the wars of 1948 and 1967. Israel destroys all of these attacks with such military prowess that they take over the land that had been given by the United Nations to the Arabs. And so this is still one of the unresolved conflicts, is settlements. The Palestinians want the pre-1967 borders and an independent Palestine, which would include the West Bank and Gaza. Number two, the Palestinian refugee problem. There are approximately, and again, the numbers vary depending on whose side of the story and whose side of the politics that you're reading, but there are approximately four million displaced Palestinians today living in refugee camps and occupied territories in neighboring Arab states. The Palestinians want these refugees and their descendants to be able to return to the homeland and to their homes that were lost in the war of 1948. And Israel rejects this idea completely. So unresolved problem number one, settlements. Unresolved problem number two, Palestinian refugees. Unresolved problem number three, Jerusalem. The Palestinians want to occupy all of East Jerusalem and make it the capital of their future state. Israel has vowed it will never give it up. Now, let me take you back to Bible prophecy because over 3,000 years ago, God promised that Jerusalem would be established as the capital of Israel forever. And so that is why not only Israel is unbending on this subject, but Christians know that if Bible prophecy is accurate, and I wholeheartedly believe that it is, Israel will never divide Jerusalem, and the Arabs will never be allowed to occupy 
East Jerusalem nor make it as one of their capitals. But this is again one of the unresolved problems. Now, problem number four. Problem number one, we're dealing with the settlement issue. Problem number two, we're dealing with the uh, Palestinian refugee issue. Problem number three is Jerusalem, and the fourth is terrorism. There is a rise of terrorist groups, uh, according to Israel and according to uh, much military intelligence. Now, the Arabs and the Palestinians would all deny this, and of course they wouldn't refer to them as terrorists anyway. Historically, they refer to them as freedom fighters. And so the Arab nations call them freedom fighters. Israel and much of the world, including the United States, calls them terrorists. And it would include Fatah, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic uh, Jihad, uh, the PFLP. Uh, the PFLP is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Al-Qaeda, and other small factions. But there is military intelligence that proves this. Most of the world understands that terrorism in recent years has been on the rise in this part of the world. Now before I take you in to the book of Daniel and before I take you in to explaining this peace treaty that has been brokered by our president and how this fits into the final pieces of human history and Bible prophecy, there's just one more small chapter in this Middle Eastern understanding that you need to have an understanding of and that is the views. I want you to understand the views of the Palestinians. I want you to understand the views of the Jewish nation. And I want you to understand the views of the United States of America. And again, please take notes on this. These are the three views that are shaping modern history. And when you understand the views from this moment forward, you will have a much clearer understanding when you're listening to headlines concerning this Middle Eastern conflict and Bible prophecy, you'll have a much clearer understanding as to how all of this ties together. So let's go over those three views. The Palestinian view, the Israeli view, and the view of the United States of America. Let's begin with the Palestinian view. Now, uh, there are diverse views because there has not been uh, a single view embraced by the Palestinians. There has been, depending upon the extreme positions, there have been diverse views. But for some, the conflict dates all the way back to 1948, uh, as you might imagine, and a strong resentment over the recognition of Israel as a state. Uh, many in the Palestinian view have never lost their anger and their resentment of the confusion of the British promises and the UN coming in as a moderator and giving a partition plan allowing Israel to be recognized as a state. Some of the more extreme Palestinians still go all the way back to 1948 and they don't believe that Israel should exist and they don't believe that Jews have a right to live, period. And if they had their way, they would exterminate them, not only from that part of the world, but from all of the world. Those who do not accept the statehood of Israel call for the overturning of Israel and the elimination of all Jewish occupants. Many of you have heard of the group Hamas. They're often in the news uh, connected with terrorism and suicide bombers and, and so on. But they would be an organization that would hold this view, uh, which is called the maximalist view. And the Palestinians, uh, Yasser Arafat, PLO, all of them held to this view. Israel should not even exist. The Jews should be exterminated. This view has an unbending position to bring home all of the refugees 
and the displaced Palestinians from the Arab regions of the world and refugee camps, all of these in this extreme position, believe that all of the Palestinians should return to this land and the total eradication of Israel. This extreme view, however, has evolved over time, uh, going back into the 60s, towards a willingness to negotiate and instead seek a two-state solution. Write that down. A two-state solution. Very important. The two-state position has gained popularity among more reasonable minds in the Arab world. Uh, the Oslo Accords demonstrated the recognition of this acceptance by the then Palestinian leadership of the state of Israel having a right to exist in return for the withdrawal of the Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. However, there are reoccurring problems throughout this peace process negotiation. And there are two prevalent problems that derail the peace process uh, and have almost, as many of you know, there have been multitudes of accords and summits and treaties. Uh, this current one in August of 2020 brokered by President Donald J. Trump uh, with Israel and with the United Arab Emirates uh, though it is significant, the first one in more than 25 years, there have been multiple attempts at peace accords and peace treaties, but there have always been two problems, and this is important, write it down. There have always been two prominent problems that have derailed these peace treaties in the process. And a feeling that uh, Israel offers too little, the Arabs have never been content with what Israel has put on the plate in the process of peace negotiations. And Israel has always had a mistrust of the actions and the motives of the Arabs. The demand for the right to return by the Palestinian refugees to Israel has remained a cornerstone of the Palestinian view and has been repeatedly enunciated by the Palestinian current president, Mahmoud Abbas, who is leading the Palestinian peace effort. Now, let's just talk for a few moments about the Israeli view. Uh, you have a basic understanding as to the evolution of the Palestinian view. What is the view of Israel? Uh, much like the Palestinians, there are some diverse uh, views in their peace process. The official position, and this would be the official modern position, but the official position of the state of Israel is that peace should be negotiated on the basis of giving up some control of the occupied territories in return for a stop of conflict, violence, and terrorism. Very important that you understand this and write this down. This is the current modern position of Israel. They are willing to yield control of some of the occupied territories provided they are given assurance that there is going to be a stop in terrorism and in violence and suicide bombers and, and all of the rest of the violence that goes with that. Israel's position is that the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, he is the one who, uh, after Yasser Arafat died in 2004, if my memory serves me right, uh, he is the current Palestinian leader. Israel believes that the negotiation should be with this Palestinian president and not Hamas. Because Hamas has a very checkered history in violence and engaging in escalating problems and suicide bombing and the attack of innocent Israeli and Jewish civilians. Hamas has a terrible track record and the official position of Israel 
is if there's going to be progress in peace, they don't want to deal with Hamas. They want to deal with the president of the Palestinian state, Mahmoud Abbas. The Oslo Accords of 1993, uh, the Camp David Summit of 2000, uh, these negotiations revealed the possibility of a two-state system, and this two-state solution is the consensus position among the majority of Israelis and Israeli leadership. All right, let's just pause for a moment. You have an understanding of the Palestinian view. You now should have an understanding of the consensus of the Israeli view, which would be an allowance of a two-state position with the assurance that they would not be dealing with Hamas or nego negotiating with Hamas leadership, but the president of the Palestinian state, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. The first intifada or attack of uh, sustained war with the Palestinians, violent riots, the occupation of the West Bank, uh, that began over 20 years ago and uh, from about 2000 to 2005. Uh, you'll sometimes hear the second intifada also known as the Al-Aqsa Infatada, was a period uh, from 2000 to 2005, which I mentioned. Palestinians describe this as an uprising against Israel, and the Israelis consider it a prolonged terror campaign. Let's go to the third view, the U.S. view, and then we're going to go straight into Bible prophecy and answer the question. Does this peace treaty brokered by President Donald J. Trump fit into the pages of final end times prophetic content? The view of the United States is very simple, and uh, there are divergent views on the peace process uh, depending upon which administration and which U.S. officials have been involved which lobbying groups, but by and large, the United States views uh, have just three common denominators. If you're taking notes, write them down. Uh, this is the official, by consensus, U.S. view of the Middle Eastern conflict, all having three common denominators. Number one, Israel must give up some of the land that it conquered in 1967 in order to achieve peace. The United States consensus, number one, is that we, and Israel's willing, as you just listened to the Israeli view, is really as Israeli leadership is willing to reconsider boundaries, and this is number one for the United States as well. Israel must give up some of that land that it reconquered in the 1967 war in order to achieve peace. Number two, Palestinians must actively prove that they're willing to cease terroristic activities in totality. That's a non-negotiable, not only for Israel, but for the United States. If the Palestinians genuinely want peace in this region of the world, they must take steps, and they've not done a good job of this in the past. They have violated it. You'll remember this is one of the two issues where these peace treaties most oftentimes derail. But this is the second negotiating piece of the U.S. position. The Palestinians must cease all terroristic activities. And they've got to prove that they're not training behind the scenes and that they're not raising up terrorist groups that they are actively dismantling existing terrorist groups, that they're not purchasing weapons and arming themselves from other regions of that part of the world. And then thirdly, Israel has an unconditional right to exist. So there in a nutshell is the U.S. position uh, and the consensus position, regardless of politicians, and regardless of administrations and regardless of U.S. players and secretaries of state and vice presidents, etc., 
uh, throughout history who have been a part of the peace process, those three things have been the United States position. Israel must give up some of the land that it occupied after the 67 war. Palestinians must take steps to prove that they have completely cleansed themselves of terrorism. And thirdly, Israel has a right to exist. Now all of that leads up to the grandiose question. And the grandiose Bible prophecy question is this. Will this current U.S. peace treaty with Israel and the United Arab Emirates be the beginning of peace in Israel in context with Bible prophecy? Because of all of the questions that have come in to me via social media and private messages and Instagram and so on, this is the nutshell about all of which revolve around. Is this peace treaty, August 13th, 2020, brokered by our current president, Donald J. Trump, with Israel and the Arab state of the UAE, is this the biblical prophecy in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation and is this the beginning of the end? Peace in the Middle East is the most treasured prize uh, in international diplomacy. It has been the prize politically of all foreign international goals. Peace in the Middle East. The American presidential administration after administration uh, has almost all uh, taken some attempt at trying to resolve Middle East process. But try as they may, this is very important, try as they may, as sincere as they may be, no diplomat, no secretary, no president, will be able to bring lasting peace to the Middle East. So if you want an answer to the question in one boiled down refined statement, there it is. No American president, no American leader will ever be able to broker a successful peace treaty with Israel, period. That's the answer if you believe this book. That is the answer if you are a student of Bible prophecy. Now it's one thing for me to just give a hard-lined dogmatic answer without giving you biblical support. And I think most of you know me well enough that I'm not going to conclude without giving you some biblical support. The Bible says, and write this down, this is a solid gold nugget of Bible prophecy information. Did you hear me? Write this down. This is a solid gold nugget of Bible prophecy information. The Bible says, that peace will come to the Middle East when and only when Jesus Christ sets his feet back on this earth to rule and to reign. I want to say it again for those that are writing it down. This is an absolute Bible prophecy truth. There is no theological wiggle room for this. There is no interpretation to the left. There is no interpretation to the right on this biblical, prophetic, end time fact. Here it is again. The Bible said that peace will come to the Middle East when and only when the Lord Jesus Christ sets his feet on this earth to rule and to reign. The great prophet Isaiah called the Lord Jesus Christ 
the Prince of Peace. However, before Christ returns to bring peace, the Bible tells us in prophecy that there will be a false Christ, the Antichrist, who will establish a counterfeit kingdom and bring a seven-year peace treaty to the Middle East. Very, very important. Very, very important that you understand this. The chronology of prophecy tells us that before Jesus Christ, God's only Son, coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, before He comes and His feet in the second coming touch the Mount of Olives, He returns with His saints to rule and to reign and to set up God's original plan, a new heaven and a new earth where everyone is right with God. Before the Lord Jesus returns in the second coming, a false Christ that the Bible calls the beast or the Antichrist. He will arise out of global conflict. As you've heard me teach in one of our recent teachings on Bible prophecy and what will happen to America in the future. I lay out in that teaching the four main scenarios, the potential biblical prophetic scenarios of what is going to happen to America in the last days. If you've not already listened to that teaching, I would highly encourage you to go back and listen to it. In fact, listen to it until you retain it. But what I believe to be the major potential scenario is that the rapture of the church, which is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God, is going to throw this world into such chaos and disarray, I believe because of the paratio, the, the Christians in this nation more than any other nation of the world, the rapture of somewhere between 25 and 65 million Christians just from the United States of America alone will cause an, a, a complete collapse economically. It'll cause chaos in such a fashion that in the void of America's collapse, a world leader is going to arise, and I believe the rapture changes everything. I believe the rapture is what is going to cause the world to cry out for an international mediator, and the Antichrist will arise to fill that void, and before Christ brings lasting peace, the Antichrist, according to prophecy, is going to offer a seven-year trial period. This period of time in the Bible is called the Great Tribulation. But even that peace treaty is going to fail because the author of that peace treaty, the Antichrist, is going to betray that treaty himself. And three and a half years into the Great Tribulation, he is going to desecrate the Holy of Holies, causing the utmost wrath of God in the great tribulation to be poured out. Jesus said that in that last three and a half years, that if God had not shortened the days, that none on this planet would survive. Half of the world's population is going to be eliminated through a series of wars and bowls and judgments and wrath and disease and plague and so on. Over 4 billion people on planet earth are going to be eliminated suddenly during the Great Tribulation. And that peace treaty will fail. It's very important that you understand this. All peace treaties in the Middle East, all peace treaties that involve Israel will fail until the Lord Jesus Christ returns in the second coming. Did you hear me? That is absolute Bible, dogmatic, prophetic truth. And there is no theological variance in that position. The Antichrist will just be another global politician who will try to establish peace in Israel, but it will fail. 
Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 is one of the most important prophecies uh, in your Bible. And I want you to go to your Bible and read this with me. And I'm going to close in just a moment. I so much appreciate your attention. Uh, today has not been fluff. Today's teaching has not been perhaps the easiest of teachings that I'll ever present. But I felt like you needed to have someone, and many of you perhaps already understand this part of history. Uh, I wonder how many of you would know it all the way from Genesis chapter 16 and God's covenant promise with Abraham up until 2020. How many of you would be able to weave that thread of Bible prophecy through the Middle Eastern conflict? Uh, probably many of you needed at least a review or a summary. I've done my best to provide that for you today. Again, you're going to need to listen to this broadcast more than once uh, to retain it. I would suggest at least three times you need to listen to this broadcast or until you have a working knowledge as to how Israel throughout Bible history, through modern history, through war history, through political history, through Middle Eastern conflict history, up until modern times, until you understand those with some working knowledge, listen to it again and again. Let's go to Daniel 9.27. The Bible says the ruler, this is speaking of the Antichrist, the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. Now again, this is in Daniel 9.27. This is prophesying about the coming one world leader that the Bible calls the ruler, the beast, the antichrist. And the Bible tells us that he will sign the first successful peace treaty with Israel for one set of seven, which is seven years. Then Daniel 9.27 tells us that after half this time, that's three and a half years, he will desecrate the temple and defile the Holy of Holies and the final and utmost extreme pent-up wrath of God will be poured out in the last half of the Great Tribulation. When the world gets its first glimpse of the Antichrist, he will appear as one of the greatest international peacemakers who has ever held international distinction. The signing of this covenant is one of the most important end time prophecies. Daniel 9 27. That's why I took the time to go to it. It's why I took the time to read it. It's why I ask you to highlight it and be sure that you understand it because Daniel 9 27, the prophecy of the signing of the peace treaty with Israel by the Antichrist is the day that the Great Tribulation begins. The very day. Now, the rapture is a signless event, as you've heard me say many times. But we know the exact day that the Great Tribulation begins. Daniel 9, 27. And the eyes and the cameras of the world will focus in upon some room in Jerusalem where certain world luminaries and dignitaries will sit at a table and the Antichrist, it could be very well that that is the moment that he is known for the first time or at least confirmed as the Antichrist. But Daniel 9.27 tells us that he will sign a seven-year trial treaty and that is the day the very day that the great tribulation begins and it will be carried out for seven times 360. Not our calendar of 365 days, 
but the biblical or the Hebrew or the Jewish calendar of 360 days. Seven 360 day periods will be the exact seven year length of the great tribulation. And on that last day, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture is on this side of the great tribulation. The second coming on the end of the great tribulation. Charles Dyer, and I close with this very respected Bible prophecy teacher, one that I respect, uh, said this, quote, What is this covenant that the Antichrist will make with Israel? Daniel does not specify its content, but he does indicate that it will extend for seven years. During the first half of this time, Israel feels at peace and secure. So the covenant must provide some guarantee for Israel's national security. Very likely the covenant will allow Israel to be at peace with her Arab neighbors. One result of the covenant is that Israel will be allowed to rebuild her temple in Jerusalem. This world leader will succeed where Kissinger, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and other world leaders have failed. He will be known as a man of peace. End of quote. Now as we conclude, isn't it very interesting to note that in recent years, the Arabs as well as the Israelis are looking more and more to Europe as the mediator to bring peace to this region, which is a fulfillment of the prophecies of the book of Daniel. The only hope, don't miss this, the only hope for peace in the Middle East and the entire world will be the arrival of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who will return in great power and glory and subdue His enemies and inaugurate His worldwide kingdom. Now, the fact, and I hope I've been clear in answering this question on what is going to happen with this current peace treaty with Israel and the United Arab Emirates, the fact that lasting peace in the Middle East cannot happen until Christ comes should never deter us as a Christian people and as a nation to have a desire to stop the violence and the shedding of innocent blood and terrorism, that's a noble thing. I am not saying that what our president has brokered with Israel and the United Arab Emirates is a waste of time. I am not saying that. It's a godly thing. That's what godly people should desire. We should always pray for and desire that there be peace in Jerusalem. We should support and pray for our government leaders who are doing the best that they can to bring some resolution to the problems in that part of the world and in every part of the world that suffers violence, bloodshed, and conflict. So I am not dismissing this current peace treaty brokered on August 13th, 2020. It'll go down in history. Nothing like this has happened in over 25 years. Our president at his inauguration stated, and I quote, he said, I have purposed in my heart to be Israel's greatest friend and America will be Israel's greatest ally. He has proved that time and time again. As a result, America is now living under a window of covenant grace. Because God said in Bible prophecy, I'll bless those that bless Israel and curse those that curse Israel. And so our president, because of his allied position with the nation of Israel, May 14, 2018, he establishes and recognizes along with allied nations, Jerusalem as capital of Israel. He has done everything in his power to keep his pledge and his promise 
to Israel as God's covenant people and to the Jewish nation. And as a result of that, God has extended a window of grace upon this country. But when the church is raptured, that window of grace is going to end immediately. And that which is hindering will be removed. And immediately thereafter, the Antichrist will be revealed. So until then, I'm not being critical of this peace treaty between Israel and the UEA, UAE. I am being supportive of it. But I am here to tell you that it will derail. At some point, like all other peace treaties that have preceded it from 1948 until 2020, it will derail. The pieces will fall apart. There will be some betrayal. There will be some violation. There will be some conflict. There will be some act of terrorism. There will be something that will cause this peace treaty to be derailed in spite of its best attempts at peace. Because Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy cannot lie. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words will never pass away. I hope that today's teaching has provided for you a biblical and prophetic and historic education as to understanding the conflict between Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac is the father of the Jewish nation and the covenant given to him by God through his father Abraham. It is through Isaac. It is upon Israel. The covenant is established with the Jewish people. But Ishmael has also been promised a blessing and sometimes prophecy scholars overlook this. Ishmael had been promised a blessing and God has kept that promise to the Arab nations. And they have been prolific and prosperous. God kept his promise both to Isaac and to Ishmael. And he'll keep his promises in final Bible prophecy. I hope that this gives you a wonderful understanding as to the Middle Eastern conflict, the negotiating pieces of the conflict puzzle, an understanding as to the view by the Palestinians, an understanding of the view of the Israeli state, an understanding by the United States of America and the three non-negotiable pieces of our consensus. If you understand today's teaching, it will clarify for you much of what is going to happen in these last and final days. I close with this question. Would you be ready to meet the Lord if he were to come today? Because as I have already stated, the next major prophetic event is the rapture of the church. And perhaps many of you that are listening are not yet ready. I want you to be saved. I want you to be ready. The Lord wants you to be ready. God has done everything in his power to make a way for you to have right relationship with God. John 3.16 says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that reason, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel in a nutshell is just that, that we are sinners by nature. But John 3.16 tells us that God loved us anyway and sent His only Son. And all you have to do is repent of sin and receive Christ by faith. Will you do that today? I don't expect you to understand everything about the Bible and the gospel and the cross. But won't you begin today by making peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ and then grow along the way? Pray this prayer with me. Some of you that will pray this prayer, it's the very first time perhaps that you've ever done this. But there might be some that are listening. If you'd be honest with God, you're not living for the Lord. You've become a Christian by title, but not a Christian by testimony. And you need to come back home to the Lord and repent of your backsliding and your carnalities. Pray this with me right now, wherever you may be. Pray this. Say, Heavenly Father... 
Today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. In these last days, I desire to be right with God. And so I acknowledge my sin. And I repent of my sin. And I in childlike faith now receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. Come into my heart today. For I vow that I will serve the Lord all the days of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to live for you and to live every day ready to meet the Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.